There we go. Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing this morning? Good. Hey, I got a response. I was not 100% sure what that was going to look like. Okay. <clears throat> well, I've had a good weekend, too, spending time with family. They usually come down here whenever uh, I'm speaking, so it's been good to see them. Uh, let me pray before we get started. Dear Lord, you are amazing. And God, we, uh, we like to look back <laughs> in the Old Testament and kind of think, oh man, those, those silly Israelites, how could they forget the goodness of God? And so often, we get sidetracked, we get distracted of your goodness as well. And God, help us not to forget that. Lord, help us to see your truth and your love uh, just spring forth out of the pages of Scripture in Acts chapter 13. God, be with me as I'm speaking. Um, Lord, help it really to not be me speaking, but really you speaking through me. Lord, we love you, and it's all for you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So we are starting in our Better, The Better Things series. Uh, it's kind of part two of our Dwell series. So our last series was going through uh, who the Holy Spirit is, how he functions, uh, how does the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does, and we can't, in one series, describe uh, completely the nature and the character of the Holy Spirit. That's just not possible. We could come here every Sunday for the rest of our lives and not scratch the surface on who the Holy Spirit is and his massive role that he plays in our lives. And so we are uh, kind of doing part two of the Dwell series, which is going through the life of Paul that you can see up on our screen. Uh, the life of Paul, and specifically the life of Paul through the book of Acts. And so the book of Acts is, you know, here's a 50,000 foot view from on top of the book of Acts. Uh, we have started just calling the book of Acts just that, the book of Acts. Now the full name that you'll see in scripture is Acts of the Apostles. And that name is just a little bit misleading because Acts of the Apostles could really be Acts of the Holy Spirit. Or if you want to give its most technical term, Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. And in Acts chapter 1 through 12, we see really the focus be on the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Paul has a cameo, so to speak. Uh, that's superhero movie language, if you guys aren't 100% uh, certain of what a cameo is. Uh, Saul makes a cameo in Peter's section, and Peter makes a cameo in Paul's section, which is Acts chapter 13 through 28. And so we are picking up in Acts chapter 13 today. And Acts chapter 13, like any um, chapter in the book of Acts, is dense. You could do pretty much an entire series over any book or any chapter of the book of Acts. It is a dense, uh, dense, dense section. It's written by the Apostle Luke. The Apostle Luke, on top of being a doctor, was a historian, and so he is a detail-oriented dude. Uh, how many of you are detail-oriented? Some of you are detail-oriented. That is not me. I'm big picture I'm more of a big picture guy, but that's not Luke. Uh, he gives a lot of details to the story, and so what we're going to be going through is kind of hit and miss throughout Acts chapter 13. We're going to be reading some sections word for word, and some uh, I'll just be paraphrasing. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, they were worshiping the Lord, and the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So this isn't the first city of Antioch that we see in Acts, and it's not going to be the last city of Antioch. There was a a ruler in the region. He died by the point in time that this was written and by the time that these events happened, but his name was Antiochus. And so he liked to name cities after himself. It's a fairly vain move, but um, there were a lot of different cities named uh, Antioch, and this one is specifically Antioch of Syria. Even later on in this chapter, we go to a different Antioch. But the Antioch of Syria was kind of the home base or the headquarters for the different missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. They were the ones that kind of bankrolled uh, Paul's missionary journeys and allowed him and Barnabas to do what they were supposed to do, which we see uh, what that is. The Holy Spirit sends them out to be able to go preach the gospel. Another thing that we can point out about this uh, this specific text, uh, verses 1 through 3, is just the names that are associated with the worship of God. Um, Barnabas, who uh, is kind of Saul's, going to be Paul's, his name actually changes in this chapter, uh, he's, Bar- he's Paul's helper. Uh, he is the guy that is initially the front man in the missionary team of Paul and Barnabas. His name comes first um, for a little bit of time, but eventually the roles kind of switch. Saul, who becomes Paul, becomes the front man of the missionary duo, the dynamic duo, and Barnabas takes more of a backstage role. He becomes the support and comes the help. Simon called Niger, which means he was from, more than likely, North Africa, just like uh, where we see Lucius of Cyrene was from North Africa. They would have looked different than what Barnabas, Paul, and Menaean would have looked like. And I think that Luke Luke puts those details in there, once again, being a detail-oriented person, that the gospel is for everyone. There's no discrimination in the gospel. There's no dividing walls, no barriers in the gospel. Um, Menaean was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, uh, which means, and the word, Greek word for that, really means foster brother or foster son of Herod the Great. And so he grew up in uh, just lavished riches. Uh, He would have been at the very top crust socially, um, whereas other people mentioned in here would have been the bottom rung of society, at least earning potential-wise. And so no matter the race, no matter the socioeconomic status, it doesn't matter. The gospel is for everybody, no matter what. In fact, see how I mix and move. Uh, We've got a budding teen section over here that I'm super happy about. But um, we, uh, the the gospel, or or the the central message of that week is the gospel is for everybody. It's for you, it's for me, no matter what our sin has done, and it's for everybody out there. So that's Acts chapter 1, verse 3. We are seeing the mission. We are seeing Paul and Barnabas get sent. The Holy Spirit has set them apart to be sent on these missionary uh, journeys to go send the gospel out to the rest of the world. (laughs) Acts chapter 13, 6 through 11. They traveled through the whole island, and so we skipped a little bit. From 4 to 5, we see kind of the traveling plans of Paul and Barnabas. And they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, which would have meant son of Jesus. Uh, Now, this isn't our Jesus. Jesus actually was not all that uh, different, or or it was a fairly common name. Um, The the actual way you would have said it in Aramaic is Yeshua, which stands for God saves. And so, from a Jewish base, this actually wasn't all that uncommon of a name, And so we have son of Jesus, which means he would have been Jewish, a Jewish sorcerer. Jewish sorcerer is almost something that would be an oxymoron, kind of like jumbo shrimp or quiet junior high boy. Like the words don't go together. The words should not ever be seen together to describe one person. Jewish sorcerer, what? 
And, I mean, the thing that, that immediately hits me is what happened in this guy's life? What happened in Bar Jesus' life to take him from a, a male Jew who would have been brought up knowing the law of Moses, would have been brought up knowing the practices, the rituals, the love of God, the movements of God through the Old Testament? And how did he land here as a sorcerer in Paphos? That should not happen. How did he get to that point? And we see Bar Jesus, unfortunately, stand in the way of the gospel. Let's continue reading. Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, or essentially governor of the region, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the sorcerer, so we have son of Jesus is one way that he is referred to, and then we have Eliamus, which would have been his Greek name. Uh, but Eliamus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, there we see the name change. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Eliamus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teachings about the Lord. And so I don't know what that says about Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. The first sign that Paul says is, or the first uh, sign that Paul performs is uh, him making someone blind right after calling him the son of the devil. Um, I mean, that's, what a way to start off. Starting off with a bang, for sure. But the first point that we can get out of Acts chapter 13 is this, if I use the right remote. The Holy Spirit sends you to proclaim truth. The Holy Spirit sends you to proclaim truth. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking on these words this morning. I'm the one saying these words. But up until very recently, I was the one that needed to hear these words, um, much more than what I needed to speak them. Um, and so I say, I say all of this out of love, guys, and I say this out of encouragement. I really do. Please do not hear it in a tone other than that. I also prayed over every line of what I'm about to say, um, and I have taken out any feelings and opinions because my feelings and opinions on this do not matter, especially in the context of preaching. I respect the institution of preaching way too much to start spewing out my thoughts and opinions. And so typically I'm pretty conversational while preaching, but I'm just going to read this line for line because I've prayed over every line, and if I'm conversational and preaching, I might tend to go down a rabbit trail. I don't want to do that. I want to stick to what I have prayed over in this next section. Next thing I want to say, concerning about this next section that I'm going to teach on, I think that we've done fairly well. I think that we've done very, fairly well during this time period. We have been in very, very high tension, and we have been in a very, very, very polarizing time period. I think Lakewood Christian Church has done extremely well in navigating these times in love. However, we've been going through this race, this politically tense race, and this pandemic-fueled race for 18 to 19 months now. I'm tired of it. You're tired of it. We're exhausted. Who can run for 18 to 19 months this race without getting a little tired from time to time? I woke up early Tuesday morning and couldn't even run a full mile before I had to stop and catch my breath because I thought I was going to die. And so 18 to 19 months of doing this, we're all a little mentally exhausted. And in our exhaustion, it's easy to fall into traps of bitterness and anger. So our first point of the day, like I said, let's buckle up. Holy Spirit sends you to proclaim truth. Truth is a little funky in today's world. 
Truth is just a little bit, it's unclear where to find truth. And you can make the truth say whatever you want it to say. You can go to Facebook, Fox, Fox News, CNN News, whatever medium you want to get your preferred truth and get the confirmation of that truth that you want. If I want to see negative things about vaccinations, I go to Fox. If I want to see uh, horrible things about the pandemic, then I can go to CNN. If I want to see people fighting over differing opinions, I can go to Facebook. I have seen different truths rip this nation to shreds. I have seen it. You have seen it because we are living in the midst of it. Now, we as the church, and I talk the Big C Church, remember, in saying these things, I think Lakewood has done a tremendous job. We as the Big C Church need to be reminded of the subjectivity of this world and the objectivity of the gospel of Christ. A subjective truth is a truth based off of a person's perspectives, feelings, or opinions. The things underneath the heading of this subjectivity would be things like the pandemic. I'm not saying that the pandemic doesn't exist. It absolutely exists. I think everybody would agree that it exists. But everything surrounding the pandemic is subjective. There's so many feelings, so many thoughts, so many differing viewpoints that it's all subjective. And in this room, we have represented two totally different ideas as to how it should be approached. The other thing is politics. Politics has been pretty crazy here recently. And in this room, we have two totally different viewpoints and opinions on the subject matter. Now, quite frankly, the list could go on and on and on over the things that are divisive in this nation and over the things that are potentially divisive in the church. And generally speaking, typically, preachers will avoid politics, and, and I follow suit, um, like, I don't like getting political, especially behind the pulpit, because we got way more important things to talk about. We got the kingdom of heaven to talk about, not the Republic of America. Um, however, these subjective truths, like a pandemic, like the current political climate, these subjective truths, these subjective truths have a tendency to pile up and pile up to where it becomes a dividing line in our churches, and that's something that needs to be addressed. So often in our churches, when these subjective truths become so passionately fought over, that the battle lines in the churches during politically charged time periods are drawn so staunchly down the middle that these subjective truths start to become a bigger presence in the church than the objective truth of Jesus Christ. Church auditoriums in America look more like the Congressional Hall in D.C. during the State of the Union Address, as opposed to the worship halls that they're supposed to be. You've got your Republican Christians, you've got your Democrat Christians split down the middle, opposing one another, distrustful of one another, bickering with one another, and bewildered with one another, either at their lack of sensitivity or their lack of common sense. And once you have picked your side, there's typically not much crossing the aisle. I wish that was the only thing that divided us, but we have added on top of that a pandemic. People think that churches should be, should be closed to protect our congregants physically or should have such stringent protocols that our churches look more like hospitals than they do churches. And when that expectation isn't met, one of two things happen. It harbors up bitterness and anger, and the second thing, it can lead to lashing out. Other people think that this is the last place that we should have any precautions or restrictions, and it should almost be a place of civil disobedience. And when those, things, when those expectations aren't met, it can do one of two things. It can harbor up bitterness, and it can lead to lashing out. The subjective truths that you have witnessed and that I have witnessed ripping apart the nation are some of the same truths that are ripping many of the churches that I've seen. Many churches are being ripped to shreds because of the disunity in all of this. People are sitting in churches or watching services online, mad at the preachers preaching, mad at the singers singing, mad at the people in front, behind, or left to the right of them because they don't believe in the subjective truth or don't believe in the manner of the subjective truth that I believe in. They're not feeling the way that I'm feeling. They're not responding the way that I'm responding. So they either don't care about people's physical health or they don't care about people's mental health. And that's the conclusion that we draw sometimes. 
And if we allow Lakewood, once again, I don't think we've done this. I think we've been pretty spectacular in our approach the last 18 or 19 months. Make sure you remember me saying that. I think that we've done very well. I'm just serving this as a warning. But if this church becomes that, if this church becomes that, then this church looks a whole, like, a whole lot more like the world it's called to redeem rather than the Savior, or rather than the kingdom of heaven where our Savior comes from. All of these subjective truths pile up and pile up and pile up to the point where they are interfering with the objective truth of Scripture. And the objective truth of Scripture says that sin is very much real and very much alive right now, and sin, much like a virus, spreads like wildfire. It contaminates everything that it touches, and unlike the current virus going around, its death rate is 100%. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And yet we have a fix or a vaccine, if you will, that is 100% effective in its fight against sin and death. That fix being faith in a Savior, a Savior who came to be a sacrifice willingly to render the power of sin obsolete and eradicated. The subjective truths of this world cannot be more important than the objective truth that is wrapped up and founded in the love of our Savior. And the objective truth of God must be proclaimed loudly and proudly, like the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 13. Our subjective feelings and ideologies have to take a back seat to the objective truths of God. And if the objective truth of God found in this word right here tells us over 20 times explicitly to love one another, love one another, love one another, then that's something that we should absolutely follow. And that's something that we absolutely have to give into. And our subjective truths, our subjective feelings and opinions can't ever be allowed to get in the way of the objective truth of the gospel. John 13, 35 states that people will know, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, that people will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. And we need to definitely make sure that we are loving one another even in a time that we might not all agree with one another. <clears throat> so our second point of the day, we can breathe now. <clears throat> second point of the day is that the Holy Spirit sends us to proclaim love. Sends us to proclaim love. We see that in, uh, let me I close my Bible, that wasn't smart. We see this in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but at the greatest of these is love. Love is one of those things that's found all over the Old Testament and the New Testament, especially the New Testament. Love, love, love. Love, love. Can't we all just get along? Uh, The most prolific section of teaching is found in 1 Corinthians 13. This is the uh, very uh, wedding uh, ceremony. This is the text that uh, is read in most wedding ceremonies. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I might boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. it It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. I love this next line. Love never fails. Love never fails. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now we see Paul... We see Paul in Poseidon Antioch be a completely different person, really, than what we saw him just a short few chapters ago, where he is traveling south down to Damascus to persecute, imprison, and kill kill Christians. What he does here in Poseidon Antioch is a little bit shocking, because he preaches almost identically the same sermon that Stephen preaches, and that sermon is what gets Stephen executed for His faith, he's preaching to the Sanhedrin, basically the Jewish Supreme Court, and he's preaching them this sermon about how Jesus is the promised Messiah, 
And he offends them so that he gets stoned for saying this sermon. And so Paul, <laughs> after seeing that and actually spearheading the execution of Stephen after hearing this sermon, thinks, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> and he starts saying the exact sermon that ends up getting Stephen killed. And this is what he says in verse 38. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, who, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said, that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. And so Paul is doing one of the greatest acts of love that anybody could do for anybody else, and that's tell them about the grace and the forgiveness that's found in the gospel of Jesus. There is uh, kind of this magic duo, uh, Penn and Teller. Have you guys heard of these two guys? They're big down in Vegas. They've got a TV show where other magicians come in and try to, like, fake them out. Because, I mean, they've been doing magic tricks and all this stuff for years, and so uh, they win a prize if they do a trick that even Penn and Teller can't, can't uh, describe how they actually did it. And uh, the bigger one, Penn, um, is just this monstrous dude. But he is a pretty outspoken atheist. Now, he's not mean. Usually when we hear the term outspoken atheist, we think, you know, he's really hitting against Christians. He's not mean by any stretch of the imagination. And he made a video... He made a video that uh, said this. It, it was right after one of his shows that he did, and he's describing this interaction that he had with a Christian after one of his or after one of his performances. And so this Christian brings up one of these compact King James Version Bibles that's got Psalms in the New Testament, and he's trying to share with him the love of Jesus. And Penn says we had a really good conversation. He didn't change my mind, but we had a really good conversation. And so Penn is, through the course of this video, saying, I don't understand why non-Christians have such a big problem with, other Christi or with Christians telling them about Jesus. He said, I've never understood why, why non-Christians have that problem. Like, if you believe wholeheartedly that people end up going to hell if they don't believe in Jesus, why, would they, why wouldn't they come talk to us? Why wouldn't they try to address that issue? That's the biggest concern of the day if that's true. And so he said, I welcome these conversations with non-Christians, or with Christians. I welcome these conversations because I find it refreshing that Christians are doing and showing the importance of what they claim to believe. And uh, one of the lines that sticks out to me in that one specifically is, how much do you have to hate somebody to not tell them about Jesus? If your worldview and your world perspective is that when they die not knowing Jesus, the hell is the only option for them. Um, I was, as you all know, worked at a drug rehab unit for teenagers. And um, I was wearing an Ozark Christian College t-shirt. Um, probably wasn't supposed to, but I've never been much of a rule follower. Um, I was wearing this Ozark Christian College t-shirt, and I was doing this intake for, for this new patient. And um, we're talking, chatting, and uh, he looks at my t-shirt. He says, you go to a Christian college? I'm like, yeah, yep, yeah, go to Ozark. It's about five minutes away from here, actually. And he said, what do you do there? Which is a fair question. I said, well, we do a lot of study of Scripture, really in-depth, and then we, we look at leadership principles, ministry principles, counseling principles. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we, that we look at. And he said, well, just so you know, I'm a Satanist. Okay. That's a really good way to halt a conversation, by the way. I'm a Satanist. Okay. Well, tell me what that means, buddy. I don't know if I've ever actually met a Satanist before. And he's describing what that looks like. And honestly, I thought that he might have been pulling my leg or like trying to throw me off my game, get off, uh, you know, get under my skin. And he described what they do in pretty accurate detail. And so I remember sitting down with him towards the end of the intake, and I said, dude, you know, we clearly come from two very different perspectives. Uh, we, we clearly do not see eye to eye on things, but I want to give you something to consider while you're here, okay? You believe what you believe, 
and you behave according to what you believe. Yeah. Where has that behavior landed you? Where are you at right now? Drug rehab. Correct. Think about that. Is this something that you really want to believe in? Because this is taking you down a path that you don't want to go down. And so throughout the course of his stint there as trying to crack the Bible open, trying to see uh, or trying to get into this kid's world biblical truths. And at his uh, outtake, whenever I was doing his outtake, because it was basically the intake process in reverse when they were leaving the facility, he said, what kind of version of the Bible is best? Because he knew that there were several different versions. I said, well, buddy, if you want an easy-to-read version, NLT is your go-to. He said, about how much do they cost? I said, well, you can find one on your phone for free. And uh, he said, okay, I think I'm going to download that when I get home. One of the most loving things that we can do is share the biblical truths found in Scripture. And when the Holy Spirit sends you, he sends you to proclaim love. Last thing, the Holy Spirit changes our priorities. Now, the last sentence of this chapter is this, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, that begs the question, why are they filled with joy and the Holy Spirit? Because, the verse before, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. The, the word of God spread through the whole region and that filled the Apostle Paul, who just a short six chapters ago was killing and persecuting Christians because they were trying to spread the word of God, is now being filled with joy because that word is being spread. The Holy Spirit brings about a massive change in priorities. And I think that we see this very clearly, and he dictates to us very clearly in Philippians 1, 21, 25, that change in perspective, that change in priorities. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is so better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body convinced of this. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. If I live, I'm living for Christ. You asked Paul in Acts chapter 7, if I live, I'm living for the law of Moses. And I am hell-bent Tuesday to stop anybody that's spreading the word of Christ. Philips, Philippians 1.21, I live for Christ. I live for Christ no matter what. And so I tell my students this all the time. That if they are a, I don't want them to be a basketball player, football player, softball player, you know, academic who happens to be a Christian. There's nothing wrong with doing sports or being super intense in your studies. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't want them to be that, which also happens to be a Christian. I want them to be a Christian that happens to play football. I want them to be a Christian that happens to play softball. I want them to be a Christian who dives into their studies. I want the first thing that they think about. I want the first priority in their lives. I want the first thing for them to do is to live missionally for the gospel, to live missionally to show the love of Jesus to everybody that they come in contact with. And uh, I, I've got a story about one of those. I'm a very proud youth pastor uh, because our kids are awesome, by the way. Our kids are amazing. And that, that's not due to me. <laughs> um, our kids are absolutely phenomenal. I got a story about one of them. I won't say his name because I want his head to fit through the door on the way out. Um, I was at a uh, Buffalo's basketball game. And uh, this student had no idea that I was behind him. We were at the concession stand because I can't go an entire basketball game without eating something, clearly. Um, and so... I was in the concession stand line, and right in front of me was one of our students. He had no idea that I was there. And he was with a couple buddies, and they were cussing up a storm and all, you know, all this stuff. And so I, I really kind of leaned in whenever our student was talking. And even though 
everybody around him was doing, you know, talking in a way that they shouldn't, saying words that they should, shouldn't, the student, who once again did not know I was behind him, stood strong and still continued to be the example that he was supposed to be. Um, because when you get into a relationship with Christ, your priorities change. Looking like the world is not a priority. Looking like Jesus is our priority. And so when the Holy Spirit sends you, like in the beginning of Acts chapter 13, remember, Paul and Barnabas are sent by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sends you to proclaim truth. The Holy Spirit sends you to proclaim love. And the Holy Spirit changes your priorities. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for all of our blessings. Um, God, we just, we don't deserve you. We, we don't deserve you. And yet you have freely offered up to us yourself. And Lord, we thank you for that. God, help us not to forget who you are. Help us not to forget that you are in charge. Help us not to forget that you love us. And God, because of that love, help us not to forget that we're meant to love others. Lord, we love you. Help us to teach us how to love you more and more. God, help us to lean into the Holy Spirit more. Help us to be more sensitive to his presence. Lord Jesus, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.